Good evening. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. So thank you for being here tonight to this edition of the Albers Executive Speaker Series. My name is Joe Phillips. I'm the Dean of the Albers School. Uh, this evening, we're delighted to uh, welcome Margaret Meister, who is the President and CEO of Symmetra. And her theme tonight is Growth Through Transformation, Leading a Business Through Change. Uh, but before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to introduce Father Steve Sundborg, President of Seattle U. Father? Thank you very much, Joe. I appreciate each time that there's an Albert's Executive Speaker Series. Just to say a word, I'd like to welcome Margaret. Joe will introduce her. Uh, Margaret and I serve on you, the board of the United Way of King County. And it's remarkable what that uh, United Way does for our community. I also noticed that Margaret graduated from Whitman College in Walla Walla. And Whitman is, with Seattle University, one of the 10 independent universities of the state of Washington. And we have a close association among ourselves because we're all based on the liberal arts. There's 40,000 students in the state of Washington who attend one of the 10 independent schools. And 20% of all of the undergraduate and graduate degrees within the state of Washington are conferred by these 10 independent colleges. Uh, they are financed independently, except our students get state need grants and Pell grants that help them with their educations. It's a wonderful association. It's great to have a person who's a graduate of one of the one of the schools of the 10. So, Joe, why don't you introduce Margaret, and thanks everybody for coming this day. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Father. Uh, before introducing our speaker, let me remind you of the format. So she will make her presentation for 10 or 15 minutes or so, and then that will be followed by questions from a panel that I will introduce to you later. And then we will close with questions from the audience. So Symmetra President and CEO Margaret Meister leads a company with 43 billion in assets, 2 million customers, and 1,700 employees, including 1,000 in Bellevue. She joined Symmetra as an actuarial student in 1988, and rose through the organization to become chief actuary in 2004, chief financial officer in 2006, and president and CEO in 2018. As CFO, she played a principal role in Symmetra's initial public offering in 2010, as well as its successful acquisition by Sumitomo Life in 2016. In 2015, she received the Puget Sound Business Journal's CFO of the Year Leadership Award, and then more recently, the journal recognized her as one of the 2018 Women of Influence. She's a Washington native, and as Father Steve mentioned, a Whitman College grad. She's very active in the community and currently serves on the board of United Way, as Father mentioned. Uh, she is also just back from the NCAA Final Four in Minneapolis, so basketball fans can ask about that in the Q&A, uh, since Symmetra is a big sponsor there. And also today, Symmetra announced a major sponsor partnership with the Seattle Storm, so it's a big day for her. So. Without further ado, let's welcome her to Seattle U. Okay. I don't even know if I have to say anything more. We can jump right into Q&A. Um, anyhow, uh, it's a delight for me to be here. Um, so I've been a CEO for just over a year. Um, and it's leading through change. Well, one of the biggest changes is actually changing myself. Um, when I was thinking about what should I talk to you guys about tonight um, and leading through change, I'm trying to drive a lot of change in the organization, but it's pretty unusual when you think about someone who's spent 30 years in a company in leadership roles, pretty well known, and then you get the CEO title and everyone's going, well, we know her. What's she going to do? Um, she's already bought into all the things that we're doing. Is, uh, is this going to transform or uh, address the issues in the company? Um, and you know, what kind of boss is she really going to be? Um, so you have to spend a lot of time really reflecting, because it, it kind of comes as a surprise. You know, you know that you want that, and you get it, but it's not real until it's real. And then you have to start actually going and introducing yourself to everyone you've been working with 
your board of directors, investment bankers, and recast yourself as something other than the CFO and recast yourself as the CEO and start articulating your agenda. So just to give you an idea of, of who we are, um, and if we have time afterwards, I can talk to you. Um, I want to convince you that the insurance industry is a fantastic industry, really good jobs, tremendously uh, interesting jobs and neat, uh, important work. But most importantly, we make a huge difference in people's lives. So um, either run for your lives or I can talk to you about how exciting it is. But anyhow, we're based out of Bellevue. We've grown a little bit, so we're almost $50 billion in assets. Um, we, we are actually a, a diversified life insurance company. We've been in the Northwest for over 60 years, and we're almost hardly known, and that's why we're doing things with the Seattle Storm, is to build our name recognition here, as well as nationally. But we sell life insurance, all kinds of annuities, and we also provide um, what are called employee benefits. So, uh, products where um, employees can get access to life insurance, disability insurance, even health insurance. Uh, so we provide a lot of, uh, a lot of different solutions, uh, which I take a lot of pride in because these are important things for people to have access to to provide for the financial security through life. Um, we're hardly known, but yet we're really known in our market. We're a top annuity provider. Um, across the country. Some of our products and our benefits were one of the top players, if not an original provider of the kind of product and benefits. Uh, we have 1,700 people serving 2.6 million customers, uh, which is, I think, remarkable. Um, not on here. I like to share with employees every time we do an all-employee meeting. We pay out over $3 billion a year in benefits to serve our customers, protect their families, fund their retirements. It's really important work that we do. Um, what's really interesting is that we were acquired by Sumitomo Life, which is the number four largest Japanese life insurance company. So a uh, very interesting set of changes that that brings uh, to us because we have to interact with uh, a, another company in Japan. But it's a fun uh, learning experience for us. So I thought I would talk to you about changes, you can, when you think about how you want to change a company, you can go, well, our products are, are old and we need to change those all out. Or how we sell our products are, is not working, need to change all that out. Or, you know, got to change my balance sheet or do all sorts of things. But I thought I would just uh, talk to you about our goal, goals, because I think this is a way to really relate um, internally and externally. So first, we talk about customers. And you know we have 2.6 million customers. When I stepped into the seat, one of the things that I thought is, we don't pay enough time, attention to really trying to think about not only who are the customers today, but the customers that we're going to be reaching in the future. Uh, we'd spend a lot of time talking about really cool things that actuary is like, is how to design our products, and we think we know how the customers are going to like it. And we think about how are we going to get those products to customers. That's our distribution. And we don't spend enough time actually thinking about our customers or thinking about who the f future customers are and how do the products need to be designed for them? How do they want to purchase them? So key for me to transform the company is to change our focus of we have to be explicitly paying attention to the customer when we think about stuff. We've got really good core of VTS, value, transparency, and sustainability. So we really like to design products that speak to customers. But we haven't really been thinking about the customer enough. I'm not going to talk about that because I already did. <laughs> Next thing, of course, we don't do anything if it isn't for actually the employees of the company. Um, and of course, we've, as a company, had diversity and inclusion initiatives. Um, but even prior to me being named as CEO, um, you know, you look at what's going on in the headlines, and you really have to look in the mirror and go, are we doing what we should be doing 
to make sure that we are a diverse company, that we have equitable opportunity and equitable pay, and that we're really inclusive of everyone. And it's a journey. It's not uh, something you can do overnight, but we weren't where we needed to be. So I've turned up the volume on this. Uh, it started with us all having a, every employee, including myself, doing a training to acknowledge and, and be real with one another about unconscious bias. And now we've rolled out a vision for the company, and we've rolled out a first goal. And this is kind of timely when you think about just, uh, just last week was the day that talks about whether women are making as much money as men. And we've put out a goal that specifically focuses on making sure we have gender equity for roles at higher compensation levels. We have a fairly balanced overall workforce, but as you go up, we're not as balanced as we need to be. So how do you address that? You identify where you're not where you should be, and you work toward it. It takes time, so you have to acknowledge that that's not going to change overnight. We also have to work on racial diversity, so the work begins now. But we're proud to put this goal out here. We aren't where we should be, but we're owning it, and we're moving ourselves forward. As an enterprise, I'm sure you would be shocked to hear that insurance may not be the most innovative, incredibly cool industry. Um, in fact, we have kind of old systems in the company that doesn't make for necessarily the easiest work environment for employees. Um, some of how you get information about products, if you have a policy with us, is a paper, phone call, not as much web enabled, et cetera. There's a huge amount of innovation to just transform how we do business to make it better for our employees, make it better for our customers, make it better for who we do business with to help sell our products. So that's a huge initiative. If we don't do it, everyone else is doing it around it, we won't even be viable. So it's really actually exciting work, but it's also survival work for us and a very important part of what I'm trying to drive in the company. And then from a financial, you know, this is business, right? Um, we do, we have to pay attention to financial. The key is, is that our industry, what we do is we sell products. It's not the instant gratification of you get a, a cool phone and you can go out on the internet and, and do, do all your personal consumer through Amazon or whatever. Our products at times don't pay the customer until 80 years from now or 30 years from now. It's hard to financially manage that. We get money now, and we have to then pay customers a long time into the future. You have to be very careful stewards of that money to be able to deliver on those long commitments. And that's very intricate and interesting work that actuaries spend their time on, but that's our promise. If I could make that come alive in some, like, well, I'd really actually like it to be a car, so I like cool cars, but um, but if I could make it come alive in what's, you know, a tangible object, it would be really nice. But the reality is, is we're selling financial security. Um, and we're deeply committed to being able to do that. We have to generate the capital through time to continue to feel, feel the growth. So this is just the foundational part of running the company, but part of the adventure. Um, trust me, with interest rates and the economy up and down, this can definitely be quite a challenge to navigate. Um, so you can't ever uh, take, uh, take it for granted, um, but an important part of our goals. So with that, I'm going to move to my favorite part, which is where you guys grill me. Um, and please ask me any question you'd like. Do I swing here? Do I leave the mic? Yeah. 
little bright, huh? Yeah, you can go with that. Okay, so, got our furniture all set. Let me introduce our panelists and then ask your questions. So, uh, let's see, in the middle there is Clara Cordova. She is a transfer student uh, to Seattle U from Liberal, Kansas, and now is an accounting major in the Albers School. Uh, she earned her AA degree at Seward County Community College in Liberal and she serves as an Albers Transfer Student Ambassador and also as the Student Government of Seattle U Vice President of University Affairs. And then furthest from me is Laurie Baldavia. Laurie is a Seattle U alumna. She is the Chief Operating Officer for Assured Partners MCM, which is one of the region's largest insurance brokerages and benefits consultants. She has both an undergraduate degree from Albers and also she has her leadership EMBA. In 2015, she received the Puget Sound Business Journal's Woman of Influence Award. And in 2016, the journal put her on their top 40 under 40 list of business leaders. She uh, serves on the advisory board for our Center for Leadership Formation. And she also serves on the board of the Atlantic Street Center. And then closest to me is Alexandra Griffin. She is a graduate student in Albers. She's getting both her professional MBA and her Master's of Science in Finance. She was born and raised in Jacksonville, Florida. She came to Seattle to get her undergraduate degree in public health at the University of Washington. And she, there, there she became interested in the financial side of healthcare, so that uh, encouraged her to start her graduate studies at Seattle U in Business. And she works as an accountant for the local nonprofit Cascade Bicycle Club, which allows her to combine her passions of public health and business. So, uh, Alexander, you're closest. You get to ask the first question. All right. Hi, guys. Thank you so much, Ms. Meister, for being here today. Uh, my first question. Um, relates to the work we do as actuaries and accountants. Um, something I'm working on in my current company is teaching and educating staff and leadership that accounting isn't just about the numbers, it's not just about math, it's about organizational and operational risk management. And I'm always really excited to see accountants or actuaries go on to become CEOs because of the stigma that math types are just, you know, dorky bean counters. Right. And um, most of my work is spent thinking about the big picture and how to, how to make the goals of the company a financial reality. So I'm interested in what opportunities early in your career helped take you from actuary to CEO. If there's a moment you go back to that you got noticed as a systems thinker, that uh, you had the capacity for the creative thinking required for the CEO position. Um, I think that probably presented it pretty, uh, pretty early on because um, I, I, you described it very well that the actuarial profession and the accounting profession, for it to really be done excellently, you can't just be with the numbers. You can't just be in your office or only talking to fellow accountants and actuaries. You have to be out in the business. You have to insert yourself in projects, see how things get done. Um, and really understand um, the act, really the activity of, of people. And if you interact with people enough, you can actually predict what the numbers are going to be because you know what people are doing. Um, and it helps you figure out then, as you think about business strategies, will it work financially or not? It, it just becomes very intuitive. You don't have to spend as much time modeling. You should always. Uh, shouldn't always uh, trust your gut, you've got to validate, but you, you build that gut sense. Um, I always wanted to do um, other projects. Actuaries have to take a lot of exams to become fully designated. It took me longer than normal um, because I actually liked the work more than the studying um, of it, but you know, uh, at the end of the day, the studying is only a portion of your career. The work is the whole career. Uh, it was worth it taking a little longer. Um, you, you know, as far as knowing if I was going to be a CEO or something, you don't know that day one. Um, definitely be ambitious. Tell your bosses that you're ambitious. Uh, get over your skis. Risk failure. Um, people will notice that uh, stuff. 
don't don't blow yourself up. You know, take reasonable risks of failure for yourself, but t take some chances. Sometimes say things that people think are too brash and too opinionated, um, and generally don't don't make everyone um, angry with you though. Just kind of build good rapport, and it can all work out. But most importantly. Fall in love with what you do. Thank you for turning that down. Now I can actually see people. I appreciate that very much. Um, and it'll all work out, or well, it's not guaranteed, but you can have a wonderful career. Yeah, so just be true to yourself and Absolutely. do a good job. Yeah, that sounds great. So thank you for being here tonight. We really do appreciate your willingness to answer these questions. Um, I did a little research, and Symmetra's, uh, one of Symmetra's core values is innovation. Mm -hmm. With uh, technology just being at the center of everything today, what investments do you see um, Symmetra pursuing in technology in the future? Well, almost every business is brought to life it, but it, to some degree by technology uh, in today's world. It's, it's really hard to imagine any business that doesn't have some amount of technology and an increasing percentage of it um, driven by that. So, you know, since I started eons ago, um, you know, I even had a PC then and, um, and we had some mainframes. So we've always had to have a lot of technology. There's core technologies that are needed just to be able to keep track of who your customers are, the precise details of the promises you're making because contracts have different features. Um, the key things that we're focusing on is we do need to get rid of some old systems that are written in ancient languages that no one learns in college today, like COBOL and Fortran. Fortran is largely eradicated, but COBOL is still around. I was going to say, do you still have systems using Fortran? Uh, there was an actual reserving program that I think we finally were able to, to put to, to bed, but it took a long time um, to do that. So we need to modernize those systems, but our core focus is, you know, you have to um, put out a face to the company through the internet, through the phones, et cetera, um, and offer different customer interactions or distribution partner interactions. So a lot of our focus is gonna be in, in uh, enabling that interaction, which the life insurance industry by and large is pretty far behind compared to what you would see with banks where you take pictures of your checks and it's in your bank account and that sort of stuff. That's not available in our industry for a variety of reasons. Technology is one, but there's also regulatory reasons that we have to work through too. All right, so I'm also in insurance, so I love having a woman in insurance who's totally wearing Vans and is so cool. So really excited to interview you here, Margaret. Um, so, you know, my question will kind of go around the, the topic of really convincing everybody here in the audience of why to be in our business. Absolutely. And, uh, I've been in our practice, my firm for 19 years, been in the insurance financial services for 20 years, and to see Margaret, uh, you know, be 29 years and then work her way up the ranks to CEO, um, my question uh, is around the idea of investing yourself in an industry, in an organization. And we have a lot of young adults that I've mentored, and I'm, so, uh, as I'm sure you have as well, who really don't have that same sort of mindset of you know, going into a business, investing your time in a business, learning it, and working your way all the way to the top. Right. And I'd love to maybe share, if you can share some lessons on, do you, do you, do you think that's a good path for people today? Uh, you know, back in the day, it was a little different. There wasn't a lot of access to technology. But would you recommend the same path that you had gone through um, to get you where you are today for, for the folks in the audience? I would recommend it on some conditions. So. I for, for sure, one, when I started um, uh, at, we were part of Safeco before we became Symmetra. So when I first started in insurance, um, I I'd, I'd had no conception that I would be doing that for my whole life. Because um, now I've been doing it longer than I was in school and I thought that was a really long time at the time, you know. Um, so you, you don't realize that. And then I got in there, and my first job, I was actually doing investment analytics um, because I didn't actually know what an actuary did. Believe it or not, I mean, I kind of actually totally blundered in this thing. I was a math major, and I was like, well, actuaries, you know, use math. I'll try that out and look where I am today. But um, 
I was doing investment analytics, and I, I was on the job for a month. And there's a few things I realized. Uh, one, it was, it was intellectually extremely interesting. Two, the people that were, I was around me, I really liked them. Um, they, no matter how many stupid questions I asked to try and understand, because they were assigning me projects, and sometimes I'd be looking and going, they must think I'm pretty smart. But if I only knew <laughs> that I'm really struggling with this. But um, they loved talking about what they did and taking the time to explain it to me because they just loved it. They loved what we do for our customers. They loved the company and the values of the company. Um, huge pride in it and it just came through in the culture. Um, and then I uh, thought that the company really was a pillar in the community and what we were doing for people was important which was something I knew was important. So if you get, you like what you're doing, you have a really good culture, and that's super important. Um, and it feeds you intellectually or whatever it is that is important. Yeah, stick with it. If not, move on. Um, yeah, I think that culture piece is really, really huge, and it's really cool to see that um, your company places such an emphasis on it. Um, OK, I have a fun question. Good. So. <laughs> Um, you've overseen hugely stressful projects, whether it was the IPO or the acquisition, uh, data center transition, um, which I'm sure is way more complicated than it sounds. Um, what are some personal rituals that you do to center yourself and manage your own stress levels so that you can manage your team? Um, like, for instance, my uncle's a corporate attorney, and he loves trashy spy novels. Like, that's how he shuts his brain off. <laughs> I should give that a try. <laughs> so one, um, all of those projects are not done. You know, I've had to lead, um, for sure. Um, and they're, to me, and what, uh, you know, is, is key to getting through most of those things is one, you have to be um, realistic about kind of the timeline, right, to achieve what it is and realistic that uh, some of those bigger, the bigger projects in life are gonna have some bumps in the road. So how, how are you gonna get yourself and get your team through those? And know that going in, that those things can happen. Um, and you know, I find these projects exciting. Um, I, you, know, you know that it's stressful because it can't fail. When you decide to go public, uh, well actually we, it took us the second try because when we first tried, we actually did not go public because the financial crisis. Bear Stearns went under when we were on the road show for the first IPO, so we waited till 2010. It was fascinating to be out there. Um, but you know, the data set or transfer was that you can't fail type of thing, so it is stressful. You have a team with you, um, so you're never going it alone. It's that you have to say that you believe in them and they believe in you and get through it. Um, and that alone just kind of takes the stress down. Um, exercising is really good. Uh, sometimes it's a few deep breaths um, because something happens and people are concerned that you're gonna be upset. Um, they have bad news to bring to you. You have to have trusted advisors, use your trusted advisors because you can't let, let it, fl if you're stressed out and you're letting it rip in front of the whole team, that's not gonna play well. You might make it through that project, but you'll be living with the damage of that for a long, long time. Um, I have some trusted advisors. They do hear me cuss more than probably I should. Um, and you know, I know that might not be appropriate here, but I'm sorry. Um, that's I've part never, of my stress release. Never met a CEO who uh, had a clean <laughs> vocabulary. Yeah. I was doomed. I was raised by a sailor, so that, I was definitely doomed. Um, go walking. There's sometimes you just have to have those little quick hit things. Go walk around the block to deal with it. Great tips. Thank you. So speaking of uh, bumps in the road and getting through them, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your leadership style and how you inspire your employees? 
So um, I actually, uh, there's someone here, who, uh, Jackie Veneziani is our general counsel. You can go validate whether I'm describing my leadership style or not correctly. Um, so one, I think that I'm a get, get in the, the dirt with, with people kind of leader. So, you know, I'm willing to um, do what it takes and, and be part of the team to, to get through. Now, it's a little harder for me to, for obviously for every project in the company, I can't do that. Um, I try to understand what, what everyone's role is and so that I can make sure that I um, show appropriate um, appreciation for what everyone has to bring to the table to, to make us a success as a company, at projects, et cetera. I try to um, inspire um, people. I try to give people the runway to, um, you know, you want to get from point A to point B. I might come up with three or four different ways there. It doesn't matter how I'm going to get there. It needs to be the team's way. Let them create the journey um, and, and show confidence. And maybe you have to be some bumpers along the way. I'm not a micromanager. Um, and, you know, uh, counsel in private, support in public, you know, compliment in public. Uh, you don't ever want to do things that make people feel um, humiliated, but sometimes you have to give feedback. In terms of leadership for path to leadership, there's always, in order to get to a spot, there's always somebody who's either taking you with them and getting you there at some capacity. Right. And um, so I'm going to kind of ask the question about mentorship. And, you know, did you have a particular mentor? Were there a series of mentors, men or women, that you can share? And then maybe give advice to the group on how to obtain one. If you are a person who you really want to, someone to follow and you really would love some advice, how do you, how do you establish that relationship and how do you maintain it? Right. Uh, well, mentor-mentee uh, stuff is, is super important. I never had an explicit mentor, but I had people who I admired. Um, you, you could see it either, and you know, things that what I admire or what I think I need um, some counsel on, uh, you, you look around and see uh, who are the people that might be uh, good for that. So for me, though, I, I'm always looking for people who are super passionate about what, what it is that they do, um, or people who are, really can rally people through stuff. And then you go and talk about, how'd you get the team, you know, it's like, how'd you get the team through that? For instance, I ran IT for a couple years, a few years ago, um, and it, we, I inherited a culture of fear. Um, and when I first took it over, I remember driving home at night for the first few weeks going, God, I don't know if I can fix this. Um, break, break down this tr distrust that was in the organization. Um, and I actually, not within the company, had some people who had dealt with that that I went and specifically talked to about it. So I, I do it more searching for people who I know have dealt with similar types of problems are um, people who've had success just asking for tips, what kept them going, like uh, that kind of thing. I, you always need to be looking around. Some people want to have an explicit mentor, and we have mentor programs at Symmetra. They're hugely popular. And guess who gets the most value out of that? The mentees. Or the, I'm sorry, the mentors get the, I said it wrong here. The mentees get a lot out of it, but the mentors get more out of it because you're learning from someone else by the questions they ask and the discussions that foster. Um, just sit with someone different. Go, go uh, get off the elevator on the wrong floor. I do that on occasion um, and just talk to you. I can learn from anyone. It doesn't matter what your role is. I can learn from anyone. Just constantly be looking for that. Thank you. Sort of on that note, um, I was wondering about gender disparities um, as a female in finance and how that's changed as you've taken on leadership roles and um, what issues, if any, um, are new to you since taking on the role of CEO? Um, so as far as gender uh, disparity, obviously that presents itself in a number of dif different ways, right? It's just the number of women in particular kinds of jobs um, it's the number of women at different ranks in 
different careers or different professions. Um, through the course of, uh, of 30 years, of course, I've seen more women in finance, more women in actuarial. Um, I will tell you the technology side of thing, it's, it's a battle. And it, you know, it's written in the headlines all, all the time to get more women in technology, it, um, whether it's in the big, huge companies that we all um, interact with, or whether it's in the IT departments of a Symmetra. Um, and it's, it, it's gonna be a long time to solve that because we have to have more women in the IT um, programs at schools um, at, to recruit in. Um, for me, you know, I, in our company we have a, a salary system where you have titles uh, uh, all ranked out so that you can make sure that you have anyone with same titles, the compensations, right? That's like a basic pillar. If, you don't, if you're in a company they don't have it, there's, it, it'd be really hard to make sure that for equal job, the pay is right. Um, where, you know, obviously we wrote a goal that it's addressing like the moving up in the ranks. Um, and, you know, that's not entirely a surprise. I've been there 30 years. I'd be um, an idiot if I couldn't see that, right? Um, but, you know, we still had to peel back the onion to come up with that goal. And then we had to do study, like, what's it take for us to achieve this goal? What's it really going to take? Um, and, you know, what's a time frame that's a, a realistic one to put out there? And that was kind of a surprise. The time frame was a little bit of a surprise for me on, on what it would take to get there. Um, you know, the other thing is, is it's important to be willing to talk about it in front of everyone. You cannot just talk about it, you know, with women. You have to have it with the whole leadership team. You have to be willing to go through the discomfort of, you know, we need to be better at this. And there's something that's causing this to be. Um, is it a surprise? No. Um, it's just, it's just a reality and, and you just want to lead your way through it. Um, so one more question about, um, similar to follow-up question to that, I guess it would be, um, challenges that you face in a male dominant environment and how you overcome that. Um, I think it's really important for women to know that going into these industries, how, should you present yourself? Pre present yourself as you. Um, you know, I would say, so when I started uh, in insurance, there was one woman vice president um, in the company. Um, and of course, we are pretty balanced in our management team, and that is defined as vice presidents above. Um, pretty balanced, but not quite where we need to be um, on that. So a long way from one. And when I first started, there was a dress code for men and women, uh, which really didn't work well for me, but I, I had to do it because I liked it, um, which is I actually had to wear dresses and I hate dresses. Um, so when, when that went away, never worn a dress again in my life. Um, but I'm, thank goodness. Would you share what year that went away? That it went away in like 1994 or something like that. Um, and but you, it, thank goodness there's been more progress on on letting people be more comfortable in their skin, more um, living to who they are. So I'm a lesbian, um, and I always could you know it's it, you, you present maybe differently. Um, you can't, you cannot be uncomfortable. You just have to come and be. If you're in a room, and trust me, I today go into a lot of settings and I'm the only woman in the room. Um, you have to act like who you are. Um, I will tell you, there, I still experience things that are extremely frustrating. Uh, you say a great idea. Five minutes later, a man says that great idea and woo, that's awesome. You got to call it out. It's uncomfortable um, to do it, but you've got to call it out. You need to, 
um, speak up. You have to assert yourself. Uh, and the reality is, is you have to, if you see it happening, you have to, in, in, you have to either call it out right there or take people aside after the fact and say, you know, I wasn't happy about this. Address it right there, um, even though it's really uncomfortable. You have to find a way to find your voice and insert it in the conversation. It, it's an active effort to do it. Um, but you know what? My experience has been, I can't name a single time when I've talked to a, a man, whether it's a colleague or someone else in the business world, who said, God, I wish you didn't say that or tell me about it. They've actually thanked me or respected me for bringing it up. I really applaud you because I know that exists in, in our world and so really applaud you for giving that advice. I'm going to get a little geeky and talk a little bit about insurance since we're in the insurance business and Margaret is a genius on, on product and all of those factors. Um, so I want to talk about technology and Amazon and all these large organizations that are distributing multiple types of products. So the way we're buying things today is different to the, than the way we bought things 10 years ago. Yep. You can buy your home online. You can buy um, you know, everything online. Mm -hmm. And um, with the insurance side, like you mentioned on your slides, it's been very archaic. You know, we have not really modernized that process. Do you think over time with Amazon, do you think that's a threat to our business? Or do you think it's more of a partnership for Symmetra to maybe distribute products that way? I'd love to get your sense on how you think that might affect our business in general. It's a threat to our business if we don't do something about it. Um, now, no one should underestimate what it is to financially manage an insurance company. So that is kind of the cost of, or the barrier to entry when you're selling things and you have to mine, uh, manage the financials to deliver 50-year promises um, versus the distribution center for packages and getting things. And that, that's very complicated. I don't underestimate those systems. Um, but the reality is, is the Amazon experience, convenient, um, and meanwhile, we're selling life insurance products and uh, the people have to give blood. Their medical records are reviewed as part of the underwriting process. Uh, regulations require, you know, huge contracts to be delivered. Um, and, you know, people are like, are you kidding me? You know, I'm used to getting a form that I just hit the button and said I read it, but I didn't really actually read it. And, um, you know, it, it's actually easier to get a mortgage on a home than it is to buy an annuity in many ways. Or, um, so we're having to, to work with regulators and kind of close those kinds of process gaps. We're having to, I think the best way is to partner with the companies that are building these technologies as opposed to inventing them and tweaking them, bringing the expertises together, uh, working with, um, you know, brokerage firms, et cetera, and like, what do you, how do you want to evolve your interactions with clients so that we're, we don't want five million different versions of how this, because that'll be just a different way to alienate customers, right? Um, but we have to transform, uh, otherwise no one's, no one's going to bother. Just in addition to that geeky question, you do a lot of annuities, you do employee benefits, you do life insurance. Is, there any, is this going to be your main sort of product focus you'll have, or you think you're going to be expanding to other things? Um, I'm limited on how much I can say on that, but um, yes, one, within all of those products, so we're, we're a pretty diverse company, and so we're always expanding our product suites um, as we speak, um, but you know, I have some interest in some new kinds of lines of businesses that would um, either augment how we interact with, with uh, today's customers or um, just kind of add some different kinds of product offerings for us. Sure. Yeah. Okay, now we're going to go to questions from the audience. So we're going to have a mic in each aisle, I think. And whoever has a question should raise their hand and we'll bring you the mic. It's been a great conversation. Can you hear me okay? 
I can hear you. Okay, perfect. So you've talked a lot about your business staying the same for a long time, right? And then as we look forward, we know things are going to change. So what steps are you taking to ensure that you're creating a culture that your employees are on board for that upcoming change? That's a, a great question. Um, in fact, just last week, I put a, out a message to all employees and it addressed a, lit, a litany of different things, but one of it was specifically talking about change. Um, because uh, the world is super, super dynamic and we can't stay the same. We have to change. We have to figure out how to build a tolerance in, in our company um, to go through it. No matter, you know, there'll be some people who go, I can handle change, I just love it, it's no problem for me. Um, and then there's other people who, who are really honest, I hate change. Um, and then there's everyone between. The reality is, is uh, even the most change accepting person still has a change curve to go through. Um, and we need to build um, a, a variety of different ways to help people through. Most often what you're doing is saying it's okay um, that you're having to go through the process. You may have to be doing some retraining. If you do that ahead of time, you acknowledge what's coming and you're showing that there's a path for job opportunity um, and, and uh, being part of the future, you can get through that change better. Um, if you lay out why the change is so happening, uh, you can get people through it. So we're having to do a whole change man management process. When we do product develop our projects, we're having to build change in as part of the whole product project management. We didn't used to do that before. We used to just, okay, it's done. I, when I first became the CFO, imagine this. I had to go to the CEO and say, well, we have a 30-year-old general ledger that cannot be made Sarbanes-Oxley compliant and you want to go public in a couple years. We need to upgrade our general ledger. And if you've been in corporate America, that is usually means millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars for the original budget, and the actual budget's three times that, and the timeline is ridiculously long, and, and I was given you know, a certain budget in one year to get it done, um, but we needed, uh, needed to do that. Well, when we rolled out the, pro uh, the new ledger, after doing some periods of time where people were doing their processes on the old ledger, and, but still learning the new, but we sh shut down the old ledger, and we get to the next month then. Someone goes, where's the old ledger? They wanted to still run the old process. Change and change resistance, it is so surprising. We couldn't have done more to try and make people aware of what was coming. Um, but you have to do it. Um, we do all sorts of stuff to talk about innovation. We're engaging people in innovation challenges. Uh, engaging people and submitting their innovation ideas so they can feel like they're the one that's driving the change as opposed to the victim of the change. You just have to do a lot of different things. Next question. Hey, Margaret. Hey. Thank you again for uh, speaking to all of us and answering our questions. You touched on earlier um, in your presentation and Symmetra's kind of focused now to um, gain more brand recognition, whether that's through the Seattle Storm sponsorship or um, other sponsorships. What's the biggest obstacle that Symmetra faces, I guess, in the life insurance industry from how different it is to other industries um, in kind of penetrating the market and raising brand awareness? Well, one, we are competing against enormous companies, right? So, um, you know, I'm sure everyone's heard of like MetLife. Um, or prudential life. I mean, you've got these huge companies that have been around, you know, way longer than we have. Um, we had to change our name, you know, in 2004. So it's like we had to restart ourselves. And there was no cool names left. I mean, we have a cool name. I love the name Symmetra, but everyone else thinks we're technology, um, especially because we're from the Northwest. Um, so you're, you're kind of overcoming some of that stuff. Um, we're not as big as the others, so it's, it's a, it's, we have to be crafty about how we spend our money because we don't have just like throw zillions of dollars at just the name awareness. Um, but it's a fun little challenge to go through. 
um, uh, and we'll watch it. Thank you. I did see your ad during the fun, yeah, during the game last night. It was great. It's good. She's good. We have a Sue Bird commercial. If you go out to um, social media, we have a jibber jabber campaign because you, you've probably heard me jibber and jabbering up here a lot right now. Um, you know, our products and insurance, you know, we have big long contracts, lots of, and we're trying to really kind of make sure when we're um, putting out materials to really kind of cut to the essence of how does the product work, you know, what's the, uh, what's the features, what's the cost, whatever. Um, so we have our little jibber jabber characters in with Sue Bird. Um, it's a pretty nice little commercial, so go out and look it up. What do you think one of the most significant challenges is for women in power that you've kind of seen across um, being in a position of power, obviously, or kind of like a higher position. I'm sorry, so you, uh, one of the uh, most significant challenges for women in power? Yeah. Um, probably having enough other women to, to network with, um, and probably being compared to men and not acknowledging that the way we might do it is differently. Um, and so the report cards are a little bit designed as far as like assessing how we, how we go about things in a way that um, may be a little bit more of a report card style or you know how you look at it. I would also say, and I don't have the exact figures on this, a lot of women who are CEOs, and I'm just broadly speaking, inherit companies in very troubled situations. That was their opportunity. You know, that's a pretty hard um, set of cards to go with. Okay, so as like, what advice would you give young women wanting to go into your field of work? Going to uh, insurance or my field? Um, one, uh, if you wanted to be an actuary, I'd just say one, uh, like math. <laughs> um, but if you want to just go into insurance, uh, it's, you know, you want to um, talk to people about their financials, you know, be comfortable about thinking about people's uh, financial well-being and, and Sometimes that's a little bit of an interesting uh, thing to talk about. The other thing is, is frankly, we're not the most, uh, we don't get the hottest headlines as an industry. And so it's, it's being willing to be the ambassador of the industry and what we stand for and what we do for people in the face of not always the, the best press um, and not necessarily always the most informed press. Um, but it's mostly about whether, it, if you have a passion for helping people um, provide the financial security for their families, then our industry for sure is one that you'd want to be in. If you don't even care about that, of course, if you want to just do interesting financial stuff, we're interesting accounting, uh, interesting legal stuff, we have interesting IT jobs. There is a lot of very fascinating work to do within our industry. question later, Jill. Um, hi, um, and thank you again for coming to speak. Uh, you spoke about partnering up with some of the big tech companies like yeah. Amazon and, and other companies, right? That, in that entitles transfer of information, right? As well mm -hmm. as that in the insurance industry. So how do you protect that seeing what we've seen in the past, that data breaches and things like that that led to massive headaches right. for Right. for clients. Yeah, um, when I was running IT, and so by the way, when I was running IT, I was the CFO of the company, so I was super dependent. My success was very much dependent on um, everyone else but me. Um, it was a strict leadership play. Um, so the thing that actually kept me up at night is, is the data security. Uh, we do all sorts of uh, what are called penetration tests, and we have 
a whole security program that is, uh, you're, you have to invest in it and have a vigilance of, of keeping that uh, program up with what's going on in the world because criminals are criminals 100% of the time. And you know we're insurance professionals 99.9% uh, .9 of the time and one, one tenth of 1% of the time when you look at the total is trying to figure out how can you really protect that data. Um, engage with, we, we work with other companies. This, this is where the industry does have to come together and say it's super important. The whole industry goes down if we don't try to protect our customers. And there's rules about that. Um, if we're partnering with like an Amazon or some startup that has a cool new piece of software, part of your legal contracts need to be who's gonna be um, on the hook if there's uh, data. And you have to really do due, due diligence and see who's committed to, to investing. I do worry about, um, you know, uh, I don't think Amazon, they're, they're getting there because they're getting more financial stuff, but not every IT company or every technology company has had to think about protecting consumer information in the same way as an insurance company. You have to be really, really careful and stand your ground for that protection. I'd like to ask a question, if I can, Joe, on um, oh, one more. Sorry. Really quickly on, I know that you were acquired by Sumitomo, which is a Japanese organization. Yeah. And I thought I'd ask, you know, for people who've been in international business as well, is that, is that a different culture from a Japanese culture to acquiring an American organization? And, you know, how does that affect the way you do business? So it's definitely a different culture. Um, the, the good news is, one, that Sumitomo is a life insurance company, so there's like an alignment um, in values and what you, what you do for your customers. Um, so we have a really good set of kind of inherent um, core competencies and core, um, you know, core values that uh, make it easy to, to communicate. Um, the Japanese are very, very detailed. Um, and precise, like, you know, um, we, we have margins of error. I think they have like zero margins of error. So there's things like that where you're, you're learning one another. Um, but the, you know, they've been really good kind of going, what we wanted to do is come into America because we want a company that's growing um, and has leadership that really understands the U.S. marketplace, um, and then we don't want to mess that up uh, because we aren't U.S. insurance market. And meanwhile, we're not over in Japan trying to run them, you know, right? We now we do are trying to find synergies of where where are things that they can do for us and things that we can do for them that is mutually beneficial. Um, we have some people in our offices, primarily in our Bellevue office that help with uh, flow of information. Um, for me, you know, it's great for the company, it's great financial stability for the company, but it's been another fascinating journey in my career, um, getting to um, just learn about another business culture. Great, well let's thank Margaret for being with us tonight. Can we